his favor I see to welcome you. My name is Austin. I'm the student minister here. Good morning. My name's Sherry. I'm your worship arts pastor. Yes, you can have a seat. You can have a seat. We want to welcome you today. We want to be very intentional about welcoming you, welcoming you into God's presence. Listen to the word of the Lord from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So today, when we experience the word, this is something that will last, that will stick, that will stay with us. Amen? Amen. If you are a visitor here this morning, we're so welcome to have you. And if you look in your bulletin, we have a card. It's a connect with us card. So just take a couple minutes and fill it out. That way we can know more about you and that you can might get to know a little bit more about us. And if you turn it over, it's also a prayer card. And so you can write down any prayer requests you might have. And we have an exciting, a dynamic prayer team that faithfully serves this congregation here at Ellicott City. And they pray right after the service. And so if you want to write something down, you're more than welcome to and know that it will be prayed for. That's great. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time as we pray for our worship service. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today. 
Thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day outside in your creation. And, Lord, we are so thankful here to be able to worship together, to encourage each other, Lord, but also to worship you and glorify your name as we just sang, Lord. And so I pray that above all you be glorified. I pray that uh, we would just have a good time. I pray, Lord, that you would also uh, be glorified through the sermon that's going to be preached and the rest of the worship that we have this morning. And so, uh, again, I just pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand, put our hands together as we praise God. Hey. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, In the dead of night, I will lift my eyes, I will lift my eyes to you. And when the waters rise, I will lift my eyes, I will lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy. Now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, yeah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And in the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy. between the joy that comes from Jesus and the love that we experience in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to go to your pew and take out the Bible. I know we've been taking out the Bible. I'm going to encourage you maybe not to use your Bible apps only because We want to just have the opportunity to really get a sense in our corporate worship. We want to have a sense of the flow of God's word and where different passages lie and just to kind of get a different feel for our scriptures than maybe we do with um, a Bible app, although those are wonderful, and I encourage you to use those as well. But for our purposes here today, we're going to turn to John chapter 15. 
And we're talking about this wonderful connection between the joy of the Lord that we just read about or sung about as our strength and the love of God in Jesus Christ. We're in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 9. And I encourage you to read aloud with me as we look at God's word. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. and our offerings. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray a blessing over what's going to be given today. Father God, we thank you for your great love that we experience through your son, Jesus Christ. 
we thank you, Jesus, that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You loved us enough to give your life, to be humiliated, to be shamed, to go through excruciating pain and suffering, to be misunderstood, to be falsely accused, so that we could have relationship with you. That's something that sometimes is very difficult for us to wrap our minds around, but we thank you for your love for us, Jesus. And we ask you now to bless the offerings that we're going to give. We give them, Jesus, because we do love you. We give them because we know that there is a world that needs to know of your love. We give them because we are seeing the beautiful and powerful things you are doing in the life of this body of Christ. And we give because we want to join you in what you're doing in this place, in our community. So bless this gift. I thank you for the joy that we experience when we worship you in truth and in spirit and with our giving and with our praise with our attention, with our service. You're good. And we pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. There is a truth Oh 
Today is Fifth Sunday, and our children are having children's church um, downstairs. And so we don't have the normal excusing of the children, but we're still going to greet each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to have it take a moment to stand up and to connect with somebody in, in this community, this church family here that maybe you haven't connected with for a while or someone new. So stand. And while um, the music is going, please greet each other in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He became sin, who knew no sin, he might become his righteousness. Himself carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed be. Jesus 
Church. If you make your way back to your seats. As you're making your way back to your seats, I want you to turn to John 16, and we want to watch this video, please. you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears. Tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with foolishness. Enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world. How in the world can we be blessed in that way? How can we be blessed so that we see injustice and be moved to do something about it? To see those who are exploited by our society and world and move in response to that? How could we be blessed to hand a cup of cold water to those who have none? In fact, I would go so far as to say, how can we be more like Jesus? Are our lives really modeled after Jesus if our hearts do not be filled, our hearts are not filled with emotion about the things that he had compassion for, the things that he saw that were wrong in society? First series, first sermon in this series, I read this verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So if God's people do not feel as Jesus Christ felt or see as he saw, what is causing the disconnect? What power of God is not available to us today that was available literally to Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago? Because as I recall, he even said, greater work shall you do. So are our lives modeled after Jesus Christ? And then you may be thinking something like this, Pastor, now come on, Jesus Christ was here in physical form 2,000 years ago. So what's that got to do with me? Are you saying that somehow I am to will myself to the point where I see as he sees and hear as he hears and have compassion as he had compassion? Am I to will myself in that way? Does God not give me the power to be who and what he commands me to be? How is that possible if Jesus was physically present 2,000 years ago and not physically present today? Today, I want to talk to you about the power that God gives us to enable us to be like Jesus today. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Bow with me, please. Come, Spirit. I ask you to open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear. I pray against anything that would crimp the Holy Spirit in our lives and cause him not to have full reign. I pray against it in the name of Jesus. In the name that was given to us, that name that one day every knee will bow to, I pray in that name, in his spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that you, O oh precious God, might be made real to us today. We will give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to John 16. The Pew Bible is about page 902. We're going to look at John 14 and John 16, and we're going to look at some passages about the Holy Spirit. Beginning in John 16, verse 1, Jesus is speaking. Oh, and by the way, this is the last night that he is with his disciples. This is the same night that we saw last Sunday he washed the feet of his disciples and commanded that we were to do likewise. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the means whereby we can wash the feet of those around us today in the sense of we demonstrate and we act on care and compassion for them is the person of the Holy Spirit. So in the same way, now I see this is how God enables me to be a foot washer. John 16, verse 1, Jesus says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. It's an interesting opening verse. It's almost as if Jesus is aware that in the next three days, the disciples will have reason to fall away. In this sense, they fall away because Jesus has gone down the cross. And that death, they will not understand. And in fact, in John 16, at this particular moment, the disciples do not know about the cross. Jesus has already told them. But it is so unbelievable to them that Jesus could be killed by the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Romans. After all, Jesus walked on water. After all, Jesus healed the blind. He healed the sick. He raised people from the dead, raised a young girl from the dead. How is it possible in their minds that this one who raises someone from the dead would be killed by anyone. They can't comprehend it. 
And they won't comprehend it until after the resurrection. And so Jesus says, I'm telling you in advance so that when it happens, you won't fall away, but you will know that I am behind what is happening. So he says again, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Now move to verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Imagine the disciples' hearts and minds when Jesus says to them, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Sin here defined is unbelief. Because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. In other words, I'm going to the Father. I am the only righteous one, and I'm going to the Father. So I won't be with you here anymore. Concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world, who is who? And so Satan is judged. Then those who do not follow Jesus would follow Satan. There's either black and white, Jesus or Satan. So Satan is judged, unbelievers will be judged concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and, because, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Okay, per, point number one comes from verse seven. Again, in fact, let's read this one together. You see it displayed on the screen or you can read it in your Bibles. He says, nevertheless, read it with me, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Now that is a most interesting statement. If I do not go away, he will not come. It is, it, it is, in fact, Jesus is saying that his going away somehow triggers something greater. You know, it's like, um, it's like if I were at someone's house and I wanted to, to visit with them, I'd go to the door and I'd ring the doorbell. And what would happen is because I rang the doorbell, I mean, I could stand in front of that door all day long, and no one would come to the door unless they happened to see me, but the doorbell is the means whereby I can let them know I'm waiting for them. So they come and they open the door. In other words, there's a cause and effect relationship. I ring the doorbell, the door opens. What Jesus is saying is the doorbell is when he goes away. When he goes away, then the Holy Spirit will come, and if he does not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. That's the trigger. In fact, I would say that the trigger is made up of three separate components. The trigger first being the fact that Jesus is going to die. The second being that Jesus is going to be raised. And the third being that Jesus is going to ascend into heaven. See, I really don't think that going away means Jesus literally leaving this earth physically and ascending to heaven. Because how is it possible that his physical presence could be to their advantage? The absence of that presence could be to their advantage. In fact, what he says is almost as if Jesus knows the disciples don't understand it. He even says, I tell you the truth. 
Well, wait a minute. When is it that Jesus didn't tell us the truth? No, that statement is being made for emphasis. It's like Jesus knows that this is hard for them to understand, and it's also perhaps hard for us to understand. Now, is he say that saying that, that going away is because the Holy Spirit and Jesus cannot exist concurrently? Because some have that interpretation. The only problem with that is we had the Holy Spirit even in the Old Testament, perhaps in a different way. But we had the Holy Spirit then. That means we had the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. So it's not that he's saying that I cannot coexist when the Spirit is present. And he can't be saying that when he goes away, it means that he is going to ascend to heaven. Because we have those in the Old Testament who ascended to heaven. We have Enoch. In Genesis 5, 24, where the scripture says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch did not die a physical death, God took him up. And so, why would it be to our advantage for Jesus simply to go up, if that's what the text is referring to, or even Elijah? In 2 Kings 2, Elijah is caught up in a chariot of horses on fire. He ascends to heaven in a whirlwind. So just like Enoch, Elijah did not die. So they went to heaven in bodily form, and Jesus also went to heaven in bodily resurrected form. So he can't be saying that the advantage gained is somehow that he ascends to heaven. There must be another meaning for Jesus going away if it's going to bring an advantage. Well, do you remember what Jesus said last week in John 13 when he was washing the feet of the disciples? And remember what Simon Peter did? What Simon Peter do? He said, you can't wash my feet. You remember what Jesus' response was? says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, is it possible that in order for you and I to have part with Jesus, that we have to likewise be washed in this sense, being washed has to do with my sin. I have to be washed. My sin has to be cleansed from me, and now... Having my sins having been atoned by the death of Jesus Christ, now I can have part or share with Jesus Christ. Is it possible that going away and being it to our advantage means that when Jesus goes away, he's talking about his death, his resurrection, his ascension altogether, you see, all three parts. The key one being atonement. Psalms 51 2, he says this Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The washing is my sin. It's being washed away. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by, in, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Revelations 1, 5, he says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. What is he saying? Jesus says, only if I go away can he come. Why is it he can't come? The Spirit of God cannot come and be in me unless I am first cleansed of my sins. So the going away and the advantage that is gained is that now I can receive the Holy Spirit because I've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Secondly, my washing allows the Holy Spirit in. And now I have a front row, front row seat with Jesus. My washing allows the Holy Spirit in. And now I have a front row seat with Jesus. Let me explain what I mean. 
if you had to choose today, let's see, David. David's got his 55 on. Who, who is 55? Terrell. Oh, my goodness. I better, you choose the wrong number of the day. <laughs> let's suppose, David, if you wanted to go to the Ravens game today and you had to choose, you had, you had your pick of the in every seat in the stadium, where would you choose? Club level, how, how high up is that? So is that like the front row? So why would you choose the front row? So you see everything. So then, if the front row, club level, means I can see everything, the Holy Spirit is a means whereby you see the things of God. I, was at a, I did a wedding yesterday. Um, Ruth Locks, Ruth and Bill Locks' uh, granddaughter. And, um, and I have said this at other weddings before, but it's like some weddings, it just pops. I'm standing there, you know, here, I'm the officiant, okay? I'm the one reading this, the, the message and, and, you know, and, and repeat it. I say the vows and they repeat after me. Okay, so you know what? I got a front row seat. I mean, the bride and the groom, they are right there eyeball to eyeball. And I say certain things, and you know what happens? Emotions just fill them. You know, I, you know I've been standing in front of a bride, and tears start coming down. No, mostly the groom, actually. And tears start coming down the guy's face. Words are said. And you know what? It's so, it's, I feel bad for the, for the people in the audience because all they see is their back. And I got the front row seat. And I see the emotions. And I know the words that bring those emotions. And I know what their heart is feeling. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He gives you a front row seat to see the face of Jesus. Jesus, 2,000 years removed. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and if your sins have been washed by Jesus Christ and his atoning death on a cross, you, to the extent that you choose to look, you've got a front row seat to see Jesus. John 14, 16 says this, And I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper, to be with you forever. The word in the Greek is parakletos. Literally, it means one who walks alongside of. Let me illustrate this with something that happened a few weeks ago at the 8 a.m. service. You know, at the 8 a.m. service, we got a really small crowd, okay? It's a really small but intimate crowd. And um, I'm standing out there in the foyer, and there's a young lady who's never been to the church before. She walks in, and, and, and I'm just sort of going about my business. I introduce myself to her, and I keep going. Talk, you know, we talked about it a little bit, and then I, I came back in, and then I noticed she didn't come in. So I walked back out, and she's just sort of standing there at the bulletins. I mean, she's just like, she's just not looking at the bulletins. She's just standing there, like she's holding on to the table or something. I said, um, I said you, you, want me to, you want me to help you? You want to come on in? I said, we'll get ready to start. She says, I I've never been in a church before except when my dad died. She said, my mom and dad didn't believe in church. She said, I'm scared to go in. That's what she told me. I'm scared. And in fact, you know how when people get nervous about something, they, they get blotches on their neck? She had, she had blotches on her neck. She was afraid. So I said, hey, what if I walked alongside you? Well, come on, and I'll, I'll, I'll help you in. She looked at me. I said, if you'd like, I, I can get a woman to, to bring you in too. She said, no, no, that's okay. So I just walked alongside her, helped her to overcome her fear of being in the presence of God. She'd never been in the presence of God before. Holy Spirit is like that. He's a walk alongside. 
when it comes to the things of God, he's the one that helps you to overcome your fears. You know what? I sent that email about, about going to India. Were you frightened? I, I, I don't know how to do that, Pastor Kelly. Or I sent that email about TNT, teachers in training. Dozen people signed up. But were you among the ones who were afraid? Because you see, I don't know how many, 30 years ago, I would have been right there with you. I wouldn't have shown up. No, no the Lord didn't give me a silver tongue. I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I don't have the gift of gab. I can't do that. But you know what? The helper is referred to in Scripture as an advocate, a comforter, a counselor, an advocate. He walks alongside of us, you see. But here's what I have discovered. I've discovered that in my own life, there are times that, you know what, I just don't seem to be, I can't seem to get, I can't seem to say yes to God. Last week, I was, um, I was in the backyard, and I was, it doesn't, it's a long story, I'll make it short. There was something I needed to get the hose for and, and rinse it off. And the hose is, you know, it's, it's, you know, wound up and over there by the faucet. And so I went and got the hose, and it's got one of those things, that, you know, the, the spray, spray things. And I, I turned the water on, and I, I pulled the hose out, and I squeezed the nozzle, and there's a little twinkle. The water comes out. Whatever. I'm not turning it on. I thought I turned it on. Did I forget? Did I turn it on? No, I just, just no. I go back, and you know what happened? The hose was crimped. You know, it's crimped. And all I had to do was uncrimp the hose. And then the water, and the water just spurt right out the end. You know, I think that sometimes what happens to me is, my, is I have crimps in my life. I have crimps. And so what happens is when it comes to the things of God, it's like even though I want to know God, it's like I, my schedule is so tight. I got this to do and that to do and this person to see and this game to go to and this practice to take my kids to and so forth and so on. And my life is crimped. And because of it, even though the spirit and the power of God is available, to help me to know God. Even though I got this front row seat to see the face of Jesus, my life is crimped. And if I don't uncrimp my life by my I got to maybe I have to put something aside, you see. I put it aside and maybe I reprioritize. Repri and the Holy Spirit can flow through. You see, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is like the water in the hose. Or the Holy Spirit is like this. It's like to me, the, if, if, if you think, if I'm, the, if I'm the locomotive on the tracks, the Holy Spirit is the fuel for that locomotive, and the tracks, that's the will of God. So if there's no power, that locomotive's not going anywhere. If there's no tracks, it's going to fall off the tracks. It's going to be a mess. And so we have believers in the church of Jesus Christ that don't have an understanding of the power God makes available to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And maybe we're afraid. Maybe it's just not convenient, you see. And does he not say also, speaking of the seed of the word of God, he says that the, what chokes the seed are the worries, the riches, and the pleasures of this world. Those are crimps and holes. Till I move a little bit here and move it a little bit there, you see, I don't experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The amazing thing about this paracletos is that what you find when it comes to the Holy Spirit is everything that Jesus does, he does. 
almost every single thing. He teaches. In John 14, 26, here's what we read. It says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. It's interesting. John writes this gospel 50 years after the facts. How does he remember them? But by the Spirit of God. It says he's the teacher. Well, pfft. you mean to tell me that in order for the Spirit to teach me, I got to open this book? You know, I would, he even says in John 16, 13, he says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Guide me into the truth? But you mean I got to open this to be guided? I would, here's, what, here's what the Lord gave me uh, to, to help us understand. You know I sing in the choir, okay, but I cannot hit a note by myself. If you stand me next to a soprano, I'm going to try to sing her notes. If you send me, stand me next to Tom Moreland, I'm going to sing his notes. He's on, he's, I can sing his notes. He, he sounds like I want to sound, okay? If you, if, if you stand me next to Phil Restless, he's a tenor, I'm going to try to hit his notes, but I can't hit him. Because I, what I tend to do, <laughs> what I do is I follow who's beside me. And here's my other problem. My other problem is, okay, on Wednesday night I teach Bible study. I do it at 6 and, and, and then at 6.45, just, just so you know. I mean, you know, just so you know. You may have forgotten that. But I teach at 6 and at 6.45. Well, that means I can't be a choir practice. So how am I going to sing on a Sunday morning with the choir if I'm not at practice? Particularly if Tom's not standing right beside me and I'm standing by Phil. I mean, you know what I'm saying here. Okay, but see, here's the thing. You know what happens when it comes to music, what you've got to do is you've got to read the words. And we're also supposed to, how am I supposed to watch the director? You want to tell me how I can watch the director and watch the words at the same time? You know, is it possible that we have a hard time following the direction of the Holy Spirit because we don't ever read the words? <laughs> is it possible to see you like me? I'm just standing there watching Sherry, you know, and she's doing her dragon. Oh, yo, 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 yo. I'm serious. You've got to go with me here, you see, because this, this is true. Be believers, either you know, it's really interesting. We can get really close to God, and we can stay very far away. It's your choice, you see. The host can be crimped. Or you don't care about the words. So it doesn't make any difference whether you have a teacher. You see, because the Holy Spirit can't teach if you don't open. He can't guide if you're not going to follow. And so we wonder... Why we don't experience God in a real and personal way so that when it comes to ministry, ministry to a social outcast, when it comes to giving a cup of cold water to the homeless, when it comes to, you see, being like Jesus, we don't seem to have the power to be like Jesus. And we wonder why. That instead, we'd rather go home and watch TV. You with me here, you see? Thirdly, oh, the helper is the literal, abiding person of Jesus in me. Got to get that. The helper, the Holy Spirit, is the literal, abiding person of Jesus in me. Of course, I'm talking about spirit form and not physical form. Listen to what he says in John 14, verse 16. 
I will ask the Father, He will give you. It's amazing how many times He says the same thing. I will ask the Father, He will give you. But I ain't found in order to, 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 to receive a gift, I gotta have my hands open. What's in your hands today? Do you need to let go what's in your hands so you can receive? And I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you. And, is an and, he dwells with you and will be where? That is a location. Your heart is the Bethlehem for the Holy Spirit of God. When you are born of the Spirit by your faith in Jesus Christ, His atoning death on the cross, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you. But is He just some generic Spirit God that everybody has? No, He's not. He's the literal abiding person of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, verse 18 is a lie. Because 18 says, I will not leave you as an orphan. An orphan, someone that has no one. And then he says, I, personal pronoun, not it, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Don't ever call the Holy Spirit an it. The Holy Spirit is a he in the sense that he is the literal person of God referred to in Scripture always with a personal pronoun. But don't get hung up on gender because the Spirit is spirit and spirit is not gender. He says, I will come to you. I will. That's the spirit of Jesus, isn't it? And his presence is forever. That means this text is not limited to the disciples. Even though Jesus is speaking it to them, it's not limited to the disciples. It means that he is forever present to those who believe in Jesus through their word. He's, he's, he's present in my life. Forever, he's present in your life, forever. Now, again, you and I can crimp his presence. We can restrict him. You can do that. But he's available for you. John 14, 23 even says this. Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. We'll make our home in him. It's like Jesus wants to take up residence in your life. And yes, he has a personal identity. It's I, Jesus. In fact, in Acts 16, 17, here's what Paul says, or Luke says through, through, through Acts. He says, and when they had come to Mycia, that would be Paul, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. The Spirit of Jesus. You know, here's the thing we have to watch out for. God the Father, Jesus, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. But here's the thing that helps me. The Scripture says that Jesus is the explanation of God. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what helps me to personalize the Holy Spirit, and believe me, brothers and sisters, it is critical that you personalize the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know about you, but I can't really have a relationship with some Holy Ghost. But I can have a personal relationship with a person. So you need to understand, I need to understand that Jesus reveals himself he reveals God in the incarnation of God in human flesh. John 1.11 says he is the explanation of God. So I, when I see Jesus, I see God, and it just helps me to personalize Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, because the Spirit of Jesus dwells in me. 
And if I put the name of Jesus on him, although you will hear me praying to the Holy Spirit, just specifically to the Holy Spirit. I did that when I first started this message. How can I do that? Because he's in me. It's not a matter of you naming him right. It's whether or not you see him as personal to you. You know my name. You don't call me an it. We don't call the Holy Spirit an it. He's a he. He's a spirit of the living God. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, he lives inside of you. And what does that mean? That means that you can make a difference in the world that you live in. That means that things don't just happen by accident. That means that when you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, literally he picks up your feet and he puts them down where they need to be. Fourthly, by my receipt, the Holy Spirit is exclusive to believers. Whoa, Pastor, you have done cross the politically. Oh, you have messed up now. That is not politically correct to say that God is exclusive. Jesus is exclusive. That is not politically correct. What are we going to do with verse 17? He says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. How is that possible? I thought God loves everybody. Well, he does. But he will not make you have a relationship with him. He will not force himself upon you. If you choose to give in to your fears, whether it is, I don't know, teaching a, a class in the name of Jesus, whether it's going to India, whether it's talking to the person who on the street about Je If you choose to give in to you, I don't want to, he will allow you. He will knock on the door of your heart for entry through faith, but he won't make you open that door. He will impress upon you his God's need for you and I to wash the feet of those around us, whether that means something in the church or whether that means your next door neighbor who, I don't know, maybe there's a foot of snow and you got a snowblower and he wants you to go do her, her drive. See, he will impress you with that. He will direct you because the Spirit of God's in you, speaking to you. I understand. Tell me if this is right. Sue, where's Sue Kreiser? Sue Kreiser, tell me if I got this right. Friday night, you had group at whose house? And what was the subject? And then someone said, why don't we ever have a teaching on the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and then on Saturday, I sent an email out that said, we were going to look at the Holy Spirit. Well, I wasn't at that group on Friday night. And do you honestly think that I did a, we I did a wedding yesterday and prepared a sermon in between that end and today, this morning? It don't work like that. Holy Spirit or not, it don't work that way. No, I planned this beginning of the week without any knowledge of what's going on in Dick and Sherry Popham's house about the Holy Spirit. And we need to hear a teaching from the Holy Spirit. And how come I'm preaching on this this morning? Unless the Holy Spirit guided me, guided them, so you would hear what God wants you to hear. Now, what I would help have us to see with that is it receiving the Holy Spirit has to be, no, receiving an instruction from the Holy Spirit has to be received. Suppose I said, wait a minute, Jesus, I want to preach on John 15 this next week. And I kept getting these impressions, but I chose to ignore them. It's the same way, brothers and sisters. If you allow what your feelings are to define how you respond to God, you will oftentimes be off the track of his will. In fact, I often know that I'm on the right track when I have an impression to do something I don't want to do. 
And I have discovered that if I do the opposite of what I want to do, I will generally walk in the very center of God's will. So by my receipt, the Holy Spirit is exclusive to believers. Why? Because it says the world can't receive him. Why can the world can't receive him? Because the world has rejected him. No other reason when the world rejects what God gives the world and society is what they choose. So they've chosen not to receive Jesus, so the spirit of Jesus is not received either. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Last point. By my yielding, I enjoy more of what I already have. Here's what the Spirit just gave me a picture of. (laughs) Is anybody in here looking at your cell phone? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) Bible app's fine. Your hose is crimped. If you're looking at your cell phone, your hose is crimped. Or if you're thinking how, 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 how bad New England's going to beat the Bills, your hose is cramped. Or how, how bad the Ravens are going to win, who they, who they play? The Browns. Ooh, that, they got a good quarterback, don't they? The Browns do? Is that Mike Baker or somebody? Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about that, your hose is cramped. I've been in classes. I've been in classes where, here's what happened. I'm, I say I've been, in, I've been teaching classes. And here's what happens. I might, say, I might ask a question. And someone might start to answer it. And you know what I found myself doing? Looking down on my sheet to see what I was going to say next. Instead of listening to what the person said, and when they finished, and I listened to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying to me through them, instead of trying to figure out what I had to say next, see what I'm saying? It's like, uh, really, truly, yield to the power of the Holy Spirit to allow him to speak, and I uncrimp the hose. I put my cell phone away or put my notes away. And just listen, now I can receive from the Spirit, and he can direct the conversation. By my my yielding, I enjoy enjoy more of what I already have. Here's what what I'm going to say. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So if I love Jesus Christ, I'm going to open the Word of God. I'm going to seek out the Word of God. I'm going to seek out Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to know, I'm going to know the words. I'm going to know the words, see. Now I can can face the director because I know the words. He it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him. I will manifest or reveal myself to him. It's an amazing thing about knowing God, amazing thing about receiving from the Holy Spirit. The more you want and the more your, act, your actions show that, the more you have. There is an endless supply to knowing God. There's an endless supply to knowing the love of God in Jesus Christ. There is no limit on how much you can know of God because God is by his very nature infinity, limitless. But I control how much I know of him by how I love him, demonstrated by keeping his commandments. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit, you will not obey the lust of the flesh. 
I walk alongside the parakletos, I'm not going to obey the flesh. And the fruit of the Spirit, the one I walk alongside, is love, joy, patience, goodness, kindness, nine of them, Galatians 5.22. It's like they happen automatically. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. It is that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, comes to live in me as I love him by knowing and following his commands. And it's like I can't get enough of the precious Spirit of God. It's like the Holy Spirit is the power. He is the power of God that allows me to know God and experience God and receive more of God. <laughs> Who was it I was talking to? Told me at the first of the service, they went, their brother went to Kenya. Who did that? Who was it? Their brother went to Kenya. Where was he? Who, who was that? Brother went to... Oh, Bob. What, what, what was it, Bob? What did he say about church in Kenya? <laughs> they need to come to America. They want to limit God. Come to America. You want to crimp the hose. You with me here? See, our problem is we crimp the hose. So where in your life are you crimping the hose? You want to know God. You, it's an amazing thing about this uncrimping when it comes to my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The way I uncrimp the hose is to recognize that I have crimped it. And say, God, forgive me. Because today I'm opening, I'm opening that channel. And the, the water of the Holy Spirit, the living water of the Holy Spirit is going to just go through and bless my soul. Let's pray. God, you're good and precious and holy. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for the love of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ is so good. You are so good, dear precious Jesus. You save us. You redeem us. You forgive us. And then you come to live inside of us. Amazing. The beauty of Jesus Christ comes to live inside of me. Not to control me, but to love me, to give me. So thank you. Your head's still bowed. I want to talk to you just a moment. You crimping the hose someplace. Today's your opportunity to uncrimp it. Say, God, uh, this is what I've been doing, and today I choose. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that. And the Spirit of God will reveal to you exactly where that is if you allow him to, if you receive from him. What I would encourage you to do next is as, as an act of, of as, as an action yourself, I would encourage you to make your way to the front and just kneel up here. You don't need to talk to me. You can, but you don't need to. Just make your way to the front, and you just have your conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ one-on-one, one-to-one, person-to-person, face-to-face. Because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Now let me talk to God. Father, come. Guide us, teach us. Glorify Jesus today, Holy Spirit, through our response. We give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and hallelujah. Let's stand as our musicians lead us in singing. And as God is moving in your life and heart, I'll be here to receive you. Let's stand as we sing together.
covered in shame.
talk to him for a moment. He loves me. Oh, Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. In my God, he's amazing. Okay, as we make the transition from being in the presence of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit to hearing about Spirit-filled announcements, Tracy's going to take over. Okay. Well, today's kind of a quick one, um, and Shamika's downstairs with the children doing children's church, but we wanted to finally give you guys some information about Trunk or Treat, okay? So Trunk or Treat is going to be Wednesday, October 30th from 6 to 8. Raise your hand if you've ever heard about Trunk or Treat. Raise your hand if you have no idea what Trunk or Treat is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, basically, it's when we, the people of the church, get to have a little competition. Okay? Yeah. Um, and we decorate the trunks of our cars, basically. In decorate the trunk? You decorate the trunk of your car however you want. For example, I probably would use candles to decorate my trunk. Okay? Um, if I decorate my trunk with candles, I'm going to burn my automobile up. <laughs> you just need to know how to use them properly. Okay, okay? yeah, okay. But the lights, decorations, it could be a Halloween theme. You could decorate it, honestly, however you want it, okay? But the theme is, is that we're, we're putting this out for the community, for the children of our church to come and um, just have a really fun night. Um, Shamika's got some amazing games planned crafts, painting pumpkins, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, there will be an award for the best decorated car and the best costume. So I don't, I'm not sure if that's an adult costume and a child or I think But it's not one of fun. those dark costumes. No, not a dark costume. Yeah, thank no, you. No, this is, this, is, this is a fun, kid-friendly event. Okay, Absolutely. so I assume you want me to bring candy. Yes, bring candy. We'll be handing out candy to all the kids. From That's my what trunk? you do at your trunk. From my trunk. Yes, when people come to your trunk, you give them candy. Oh, so I decorate my trunk with candy. No, don't no. decorate your trunk. So I could with get duct tape and, and duct tape candy all over my trunk. Is that you what you could if you I wanted could. to? Okay. So He's I'm giving y'all ideas. Prize. Clearly, you're not going to win the prize. Probably not, <laughs> but that's okay. You never know. You never know. If I have anything to say about it, you're not winning the prize. <laughs> I know Shamika. So anyway, people will go from trunk to trunk. You can interact with them. This is an opportunity for you to share the love of Christ, hand out candy. Maybe you play a game at your trunk. There's lots of options. So there's going to be a sign up for you to sign up to bring your car trunk decorated, OK? And then there's going to be a sign up for volunteers. So in order to make this event happen, because we're we're anticipating lots of kids from the community. Um, there's going to be pumpkin painting and all sorts of crafts. So Shamika needs lots of help. So we're going to have a sign up out in the lobby. So you're going to sign up to be a trunk decorator, and you're going to sign. I got to sign help. up to just come. Well, we need to make sure we have enough people. We can't have them come for like one trunk. So we we got to be prepared. Okay. Okay. Your name's already on the list. Okay. I put it on. Okay. okay. And after I'll that, get Dave to help me. I'll be. I'm good. Dave, Dave's going to have his oh, own Oh, Dave's trunk. already gone. He's okay, like well, he's trunk. really going to get it now. He's okay. not helping. He has his own <laughs> trunk. All right. So, trunk or treat, Wednesday, October 30th. Austin, come on up. It's your turn. How do you follow that, Let's Austin? Ignore him. God, <laughs> Luke. No idea I'm going to follow that. <laughs> so, I wanted to give a quick announcement for two weeks from now. I believe that's, is that right? October 13th is two weeks from now. It's crazy. Um, if we're having a youth spaghetti fundraiser. So the idea is that the youth, we're going to provide lunch after the service. We're going to have spaghetti made. And so we will be taking donations, and um, you just come and eat. 
And so that's all that money that we're raising is going towards Reboot Camp. So they're raising funds to help them be able to go. Reboot Camp will be MLK weekend, so that's January 17th through the 19th. They go out to Skycroft, and they just spend the weekend worshiping with other students, learning more about God, and they're just, I'm pretty sure there's a central theme that runs through it that they're going to study. And so uh, the cost for that is $95, and so these fundraisers like that help provide ways for students not to pay the full price of that, and so more can come. Can we put maple syrup on the spaghetti? <laughs> yeah, That's put mayonnaise on That's it. That's almost be good. as bad as mayonnaise. So, are you selling? Are you selling do, um, yeah. goods out here now? Yes. Another fundraiser is we're also having a bake sale outside. So, if you want some treats and snacks and things to go, um, I can't say the calorie count of everything out there, but it's just <laughs> donations. You know, the spirit will work in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Food made by good Christian women. That's so right. where can you go Spirit wrong? Spirit filled, I'm sure. Spirit filled for sure. And um, we do have some of the t-shirts left over from Beth, our Beth Moore event okay. yesterday as well, if you want some of those. Thank you. And then today after church. I have a TNT, first, the first TNT training, okay? So that means teacher in training. You're welcome to come if you're not signed up. You don't have to be signed up for this. You just come. And uh, we're going to feed, feed you a light lunch, and we'll be out in an hour, because I want to see the Ravens, too, okay? Okay. I said an hour. Hour. Oh, sorry. Hour. I didn't hear you. Okay, here we go. Let's close with prayer. Let's pray. God, you're good. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit today. Pray your blessing upon us as we leave. Fill us with yourself. May we, O oh Father, glorify Jesus Christ in our lives and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.